They stayed on their horses as they watched him get off. They could tell by the look on his face that he probably just needed some space. As they watched him get down completely sober, bending down to touch the rocks that had been massive stones that were now crumbled into piles of rubble, touching the beam that was charred like it was a house that he had lived in, coming back to see it burn to the ground. See, when Nehemiah asked him, them three days ago to come on this journey to, 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 to get an idea on how they were going to fix it, they didn't expect to encounter such a guy mourning over what appeared to be to him the greatest loss in his life. The moon shone on everything, highlighting the despair that seemed to just stretch for miles. Beams fallen, rocks turned over, big pillars knocked down on its side. You couldn't even fit a horse through the gate. It was off the hinges. The morning before, they had met with some local officials, if you want to call them that. I mean, they, they were sort of what was left over of who was left over of the return to a town that was destroyed years and years and years and years ago. Nehemiah was filled with a holy mourning. He was filled with 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 a despair that didn't come from any other place, but God had set it in his heart. When we read the book of Nehemiah, it's such, a, it's such a, an amazing story. The, the whole story starts out with Nehemiah walking in to a meeting there, one of, his, one of his brothers, one of his brothers in heart was there probably discussing uh, the, the, the um, census or, or official business, but he knew, it's like, he's from Judah. He's from Jerusalem and he's a man of God. Hanani was his name. And he approaches Hanani, he says, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me what it's like back in Judah. Tell me what it's like in Jerusalem. And you know what? He didn't even have to say a word before Nehemiah could already tell by the look on his face that things were not well. Immediately, he was overcome. Sitting down right where he was and began to weep and began to mourn, and from that day forward, he began to pray, and he began to fast, like he couldn't stop, like it was something that if he didn't stop praying and fasting, it would be like stop breathing. Overwhelmed to the core of who he was. I think it's, it's interesting, you gotta understand this news wasn't new news. See, Jerusalem had fell over 140 years ago. It's like you and I all of a sudden receiving news that that Abraham Lincoln was shot and we begin mourning. It It was 90 years ago that the Jews were allowed back into Jerusalem. He knew that they had been there for the last 90 years. It's like hearing the news that World War I happened. Now. And we become filled with with mourning because something happened before we were even born. So you got to understand that this grief that overtakes Nehemiah was not logical grief. It didn't make sense. 
It wasn't something that, that you could say, oh, well, of course. No, this was a holy, holy grief. I love Nehemiah. I believe that Nehemiah is actually placed in the Bible. We see it, we see it in the Old Testament. And I want to I talk just a minute about why, why do we talk about the Old Testament? The Old Testament means Old Covenant. You know, we live in an era of, of new, a New Testament time, of a new covenant that we've made with God. But every door has two hinges and only two points draw a line. We need to know where we're going by knowing where we came from. And I just believe that the Old Testament still has foundational truth of what God put in us. Because the reality is Nehemiah, although it, he was pre-Jesus, do you know that he was red hot on fire for Jesus Christ? Do you know that in his heart he may not have known the name of Jesus, but he had the spirit of Jesus living inside of him. He knew that God was a God of redemption, was a God of mercy, and was a God of forgiveness. But he also knew that God was a holy God. He also knew that a holy God being in relationship with a fallen people, that there was conflict. And we can read about Nehemiah and, and how he prayed when he heard the news, what was on his heart as he began to live this life of continual prayer as the pressure built inside of him, as the pit in his stomach just grew deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think that there's a lesson for us to learn in these prayers that Nehemiah prays. He says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his covenant. I want to stop here. I, I learned a lesson from Nehemiah. I, I am someone that when I have something on my mind, and when I have something on my heart, like, I don't want to, I, I just want to get to the chase. I just want to cut for it. I called Mike Hauser earlier this week, and I'm like, just straight to the chase. And I'm like, oh, by the way, um, how are you doing? How's the, how's the family? You know, like, you know, and I think sometimes when we approach God, I know I have a tendency to say, okay, God, here's the list. Boom, 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 boom. And when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he, he starts off with this. Our Father, yes. our, 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 our Dad, Dad. Not just any Dad, but a Dad whose name is absolutely holy. I just love how, how Jesus addresses God first before he just goes into it. He creates an, an, an atmosphere of honor he creates an atmosphere of worship, and we see this with Nehemiah too, when he says, oh, Lord of heaven, great and awesome. I've been changing my prayers to just, instead of just saying, okay, God, we got business to do, let's go, and, and finding that a lot of times business is taken care of when I just stay in this point of saying, you our great and awesome God. You know, I felt like worship, we just like lingered in this place of worship, saying, you know what, we could get on with the service, you know, come on, boom, 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 hour and a half, those kids are restless, they need lunch, so we got to crank this baby out. But you know what? There's a time, there's times where it's, we need to stay in a place of saying, hallowed be your name. Your name in itself makes it holy, makes you holy. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. This king was not a, 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 a godly king, but God had put him in place. In fact, God had put this whole empire in place 
Do you know sometimes that there's people in your life that may not appear godly but are in your life because God has put them in your life? You know, we can hear God's voice through people that we would never think would utter the name of Christ. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. The cupbearer wasn't just uh, a glorified cup holder. He was more than that. You didn't get the position of bearing the king's cup unless you were a man of integrity, a man who knew how to control his tongue, who was well-shaped and well-crafted in, in character. You didn't become to get that position. The king had to trust you literally with his life because a common practice in that day, if you wanted to kill a king, you'd just drop some poison in his cup and he'd swallow it and he's out of the way. So you have a cupbearer and his job was, was more than just to, to take a swig before he hands it to the king. He was to guard that thing. He had jurisdiction over what that king consumed. This was an important role. Nehemiah was a, was a godly man a man that was not from uh, the Persian descent. So this was even more remarkable that a Persian king would pick some Jewish uh, uh, person to come and be his cupbearer. So God has put Nehemiah in a position for a time and a season, but he was not in that position because he was just anybody. He was in a position because he made a choice a long time ago to be a man of integrity to be a man who, who controlled his tongue, a man who controlled his character, a man who allowed God to, to form him and shape him. The story where Nehemiah begins actually happens long before it's even narrated. It happens when Nehemiah was born, his upbringing, what brought him to the place of being a cupbearer. So here's a man who, who knows how to control himself. He has got the greatest self-control but he's riddled with fear because of this mourning, the sadness that God puts on him. It's overwhelming to him that he's trembling before he goes into the courts of the king because he knows what the king expects. He knows why he was put in that position. And as he goes into this place, the Lord gives him favor. The king says, you are not sick, but there is something wrong with you. No one comes in with a face like this that's healthy. And at the moment, Nehemiah responds. And you know what? There's times, there's important times in our life where we respond in, in important seasons where Nehemiah couldn't have said, hey, hey, king, before I respond, let me go back to my prayer closet and pray a while before I tell you why I'm, I'm grieving. But he comes out because he was a man that was already, already saturated in prayer, that had been praying and fasting for days and weeks. And he comes in the king and he says, why wouldn't I be sad when my people's city is left in ruins, that the walls are destroyed? Why wouldn't I be mourning and grieving? The king says, what is it that you want? And at that moment, the Bible says that, that Nehemiah prayed. And we know that, that, again, that he didn't say, just a minute, king, I'll get back to you on that. Or, or he didn't be like, okay, God, just a minute, king. You know, you know but, but there's, there's these prayers that we pray. And I love how Paul says, pray without ceasing. And, and I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever read that and tried to put that into practice, but I think Nehemiah knew this art of praying without ceasing. I think he knew how to be in this place of constant interaction with God. And when you read read the book of Nehemiah, you see all, you can see how much Nehemiah was a man of prayer. It never says that he was a man of prayer, but all throughout, he can't even finish writing the story without sending out prayers. As he says, Lord, remember what I've done. Prayer almost saturated how he lived, how he act, how, how he responded in daily situations. 
And I don't, think, I don't think in that moment as he's standing before the king and the king's waiting to hear his response, I don't think Nehemiah had to take long. All I think it says that he prayed and what I think he meant is Nehemiah turned his ear to the Lord. Jesus said this, he says, I never do anything I don't see my father doing or I don't say I only say what I hear my father say. That's why I believe that, G- that, that Nehemiah was a man who was passionate for Jesus, even before knowing the name of Jesus. He knew this art of taking point one second and turning your ear to the Lord, creating a channel and out spoke his mouth. He said, send me to go rebuild the walls of my people's city. Not only that, Nehemiah said, and by the way, would you foot the bill for it? (laughs) That's why I like Nehemiah so much. Oh, he's so clever. The king says, absolutely. He says, give me a letter. Give me a letter to to, to decree it. And do you see this? This was all played out. If Nehemiah missed one of these beats, the whole thing wouldn't have happened. As we see later on, we see the, the persecution that happens to Nehemiah. And I love Nancy's word today because she talked about these little, these little dogs nipping at your, your, your feet. So Nehemiah comes and we remember seeing this scene. When I, read, when I read narrative scripture, when I read scripture that tells stories, Okay, so the Bible is split up into, into like several sections. There's some where it's like discussing, like telling you to do this or to do that. Like Paul's writings were very much like writing a personal letter from me to you. There's not a lot of storytelling in there. It's very directive, like do this and live this and think this and, 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 and this is what God is doing in you. But then there's stories that we see fill the New Testament and, and parts of the, or fill the Old Testament and parts of the New Testament. And I think that it, for us to get the meat out of these stories is how do we take a story and apply that to our life? In Nehemiah, there's no direction on how we should live, but there's example. What I like to do is when I read it, I visualize everything I want to I want to read it and I want to smell the air that Nehemiah is smelling. I want to I want to touch the the king's cup that he's holding. I want to be there in the room as the king hands him the sealed letter saying go. When you're done come back cuz there's still work to do. The king tells Nehemiah and Nehemiah says okay. I'm going. He goes before Nehemiah goes, gathers up the people and says, I believe God is calling us to do this. He casts the vision before the leaders and the elders of the city. And I think that that it's remarkable because, because the job was so big, the vision was so wild and crazy that just coming and saying, hey, God's put this on my heart. Do you know what? Uh, when, when someone comes to me and says, hey, God's really called me to do this or what, uh, do you think my first reaction is, oh, because you said God has called you to do that, then it must be God. You know, and, and so we got to understand that when God calls us to do something, don't be surprised if the people around you don't believe or don't jump on board or don't gather around you because no one knows the journey that you've been. No one knew that Nehemiah spent weeks and weeks and maybe even a month in prayer. Nobody knew. But when he comes to the people and says, I think God's calling us to do this. You know what? He didn't get a big rally cry around it. He didn't say, yeah, we're going to build this wall. But what happened? One person started building. One person said, it's worth a shot. And they started building. 
And you know what? Sometimes when God's put something on your heart, when God's called you to do a great and mighty thing, maybe the first thing isn't to rally a bunch of people around you. Maybe it's to go out and start building. And when you get a win, when you get success, when people around you say, this guy's for real, he's going out and doing it. This is more than just talk. This is more than just a vision. But things are starting to happen. You'll see people starting to come and collect and gather. You know, I remember the Lord had given me a vision years and years ago, and I've very, very few times in my life do I ever get a vision. And it was in my early 20s, and I, I knew this was a time where the Lord was starting to, to, to work this idea of leadership in me. And, and, and the vision was I was standing at a river, and there was a group of people behind me. And we were supposed to go across this river. And nobody was going. And I said, okay, I'm going for it. And I started crossing this river. And behind me, people started crossing this river. And I believe that's, that's the call of leadership. And I believe that, that every one of us in this room has a position of leadership. And maybe it's not the same. Maybe it's not, I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to draw this hierarchy. If you're a parent, Raise your hand if you're a parent in this room. Do you know that you're a leader? If you, if you have a workplace and you have people that, that, you know, that have to uh, account to you, you're a leader. There, there are so many different levels of, of leadership that we live in our life. So this is applicable to everyone in this room. So let's get back to our story. So Nehemiah begins building and someone else begins building and then you see this, it goes on and on and on in the scripture as you read. And then this person started building and they got their family next to them started building and some priests started building and, and some peasants started building. The lords wouldn't build because they were too good to get their hands dirty. But then so-and-so started building and next to that, there was another person that started building and all of a sudden, you create this big, massive wall. Nancy's word today comes right out of these scriptures, right out of these scriptures of Nehemiah. So we have to understand that, that when God has called us to do something, he is, there's always going to be opposition. Do you know why? Because there is one that's out there that hates God and hates you because God loves you. Let me repeat that again. There's one that's out there that hates God and hates you because God loves you. And anything you step forward, he wants you to take two steps back. And there was this little posse that formed. And I like to call them uh, the sneaky foxes. Has anyone ever watched Dora the Explorer? I have, I have two little girls, and there's this character, this swiper. He's the sneaky fox, and what he wants to do is he wants to go out and just take things from Dora all the time. I've watched every episode of Dora the Explorer. <laughs> You know, and I, I have to go on this little tangent. In our house, the, you know, the, the song comes out, or Dora, Dora's always asks, which way, who do we go to when we don't know which way to go? And Sarah and I always yell out as the kids are watching Dora, we go, Jesus! <laughs> and our kids are like, no, it's the map! You ever see that? And the map comes out, and he's like, I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. I'm the map, I'm the map. And you're like, is this ever going to end? Okay, we get, and, and my kids are like, I think he's the map. I think he says, what, who is that again? Oh, he's the map. And it's like, wow, wow. Okay, so I've digressed. Uh, you know, we, I, I don't even like my kids watching Dora anymore because Dora's always like, always like, can you help me find the little bird? And I'm like, it's right there. Don't you see it? It's right in front of you. And so my kids are cleaning up and they're like, I don't know where the crayons are. Can you help me put away the crayons? I'm like, Dora's cut off. We are not allowing Dora in our house anymore. Okay, I promised we'd get back to this, so... So let's go. So you have these sneaky, sneaky foxes. And, and you know, there's Sam Ballot and there's Tobiah, if I pronounced his name right. And so 
these guys, they, they're like, they don't like what's going on. They, they are not, they're not, they're not Jewish people, but they live in that region of Judah. Um, and, and you know what I think they don't like? I think they actually prosper when, when God's people actually fail. And I think that they didn't want to see God's people prosper because that meant that, that they would begin not prospering. See, uh, Sam Ballot, or, or Tobiah was a servant of Sam Ballot. Uh, Tobiah had a lot of friends that lived in Jerusalem. He was friends with some of the wealthier people. In fact, there was some, there was some intermarriage there. You know, I don't know, his cousins were married to Jews or something like that. Or, um, but it, it said that there was, there was a lot of cross relationships there. So, so Tobiah sort of had an in. So he sort of looked like a Jew. He hung out with the Jews, but he wasn't a Jew. And he did not want God's people to succeed at all. He was a sneaky little fox biting at the heels of Nehemiah. But you know what? Nehemiah took Nancy's word. And Nehemiah never once glanced back to, to even... To, these guys were like... They, they were trying to nip at his heels, but for Nehemiah, it didn't even affect him. They would write him letters, and Nehemiah wouldn't even respond to the letters. They'd be like, hey, uh, uh, let us help, help build the building. And Nehemiah's like, I'm sorry, this is for God's people. We're, we're doing this. You just kind of hang out and do your thing. And then, and then they'd be like, hey, hey, Nehemiah, why don't you come visit us, and we can sort of work through this. And Nehemiah's like, why am I going to even bother give you attention? I've got a job to do. Do you know that in, in your life, in my life, that God has called us to things? And there are those little sneaky foxes that want to come. The so Song of Solomon talks about these foxes that will come into the vineyard and they'll nibble at the vines. You just think, well, they're hungry little foxes. Uh, my dad and I planted some grapevines at his house. And um, early in the spring... Uh, one was just completely severed. It's just this rabbit just like likes to nibble on the grapevine and totally like obliterate. But that thing just kept growing and it's it's rebounding. So the reality is is, is foxes want to come in. Little seemingly harmless creatures want to come in and just devastate what God is calling you to do. And you have a choice. It's really up to you. It's not, it's not in God's hands. It's not in the enemy's hands. It's in your hands. Where do you fix your eyes? Nehemiah was stellar at this, man. He had this lockstep. But the people that were following him had a much harder time with this. It said that, that ten times... See, what Tobiah did is, is, since he had lots of relationships, he'd go in there and be like, ah, you guys are wasting your time. He would send word into the camp. You guys are wasting your time because there's armies out there that are going to destroy it. They'd say, even if a bird landed on this thing, the whole thing would fall over. Look, you guys are not known for your craftsmanship. <laughs> the people came before, before Nehemiah and said, look, we are discouraged we are burnt out. You know, we're a church. God is calling us to great things. God is calling us to <coughs> rebuild walls. I believe that Nehemiah, if you read this book and you read the end, you see what happens is, is a great revival breaks out in the land. And do you know in, in, in Old Testament history, this is the only revival that has happened outside of persecution, outside of oppression? These, Ju these Jewish people were not being oppressed at the time this great revival happens. And do you know what's interesting about this? is the only revival that happens outside of oppression was the revival that actually ushered in Jesus. This is the last narrative story before Jesus returns of the Jewish people. When Jesus comes on the scene, we don't hear Jesus rebuking them for, for losing their way of idol worship or, or, or totally blowing it. But these guys had their faith down lockstep. In fact, J Jesus' response with them is, look, you guys are so 
good at living the law that you've created a bunch of other laws that aren't even pertinent to what we've actually called you. This was the greatest renewal of returning to faith, sustained renewal of turning into faith from the Old Testament is, is this revival that takes place in Nehemiah, at the end of Nehemiah. I believe that, that God has put this book in the Bible not for us to be like, oh, that was a good story. But I believe that, that there, there are keys and tools to bringing sustainable revival to our land and to our city and to what God has called us to, the territory, our people. And I don't think it's laid out and spelled out very clear because the reality is God is always a God that wants to be pursued and wants to be sought after. So if you want it, if you want to know where the keys are, if you want to know what the message is, if you want to know what he's trying to say, you've got to search the heart of God. You've got to search his scriptures, not just his, as Sarah taught on, not just his Logos word, but the Rhema word that comes to life as you read it. I think we're going to stay, we're going to stay in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to come back to this next week. And I think we're going to, going to begin digging through this and saying, what are our keys as a church? What are our keys as, a, as, as people together? But not only that, what are our keys for revival for our personal lives? What can you do to make revival happen in your family, in your workplace? Because I believe it's all there. Let's going to, going to look at, at the first the first key, and it's a very obvious key, but I want you to know that, that it's, it's more than just uh, this key. Nehemiah, we talked about, was a man of prayer and fasting. And we in our church have talked a lot about fasting particularly, uh, what it means to be one that is, that, is, that is intimate with God, that's close with God. So I think the first, the first major key to this revival that we talk about, this and what, let's just for a second, let's talk about revival. Because if, you know, maybe there's a different, everyone has a different definition. Maybe some people don't have a definition. Revival is, is, is not, just, not just having a really great time at church. But a revival is when, is when people that are far from God begin to renew their faith. When there is a purification that happens within the body. And there's a stirring up, not only with, with the people of God that, that may claim to be close to God, but they become refined and the fire in their heart begins to burn away as the song we sung, fire, fall down. When we start to see uh, what's talked about in Malachi, the last prophetic book of the Bible, that talked about, and one will come that's like a f- refining fire or a launderer's soap. When we begin to be red hot on fire for Jesus, we become a people that are passionate for purity and holiness. But it doesn't stop there. Fires do one of two things. They spread and they, they draw in, they draw in oxygen I believe as a, as, as, as a revival fire begins burning in the hearts of you and me, there will be two things. The fire begins to spread and we begin drawing in. We begin drawing people in. We got to know that it doesn't just end with saying, look, if we, if we just sit here and pray and fast, then revival is going to happen. This is the birthing place. This is, this is the cultivation of it. And I think of, of, of a runner. First of all, a runner that's running a race is, is not going to do very good standing at the starting line going like this. Okay, I'm ready. But a runner gets in, in posture and position. In fact, he recoils himself like a spring. I don't know, where's, where's the Mickham boys? They know how to do this better than I do. You know, they, they, don't your guys do track and stuff like that? I always see them run. Anyway, they get, they get into this position, and, and I'm sure I'm doing it wrong, but they, they kind of stand at this 45-degree angle, and they recoil their body and, and waiting for, for, the, for the, the gun to go off and waiting for God to say, go, and they go out from that place. I am like 
the total opposite. Normally I'm like, I'm like halfway down the field and the, and the gun hasn't gone off yet. And everyone's like, DQ'd. <laughs> you know, so, so this lesson for me is I need to be in a place of prayer. I need to be in, if you're a doer, if you're like, if you're like, come on, I'm ready to go. Usually you need to default on the side of prayer and fasting and seeking God's face. If, if you're a person that is, that is just, you've got that down in your life and you love just to be in that place, do you know what? You need to have your ears fine-tuned to hear that gun go off because the worst thing to happen is that gun goes off and you're like, I am so ready. <laughs> and you're just in this position like, yeah, I'm, ru- I'm running this race and you're not really going anywhere. I, I was like totally, do you want me to try to do this on the stand so Chris can get, get me in? So, so we're going we're gonna to begin working through these keys that I see in Nehemiah uh, that work through uh, revival. But we have a few minutes left and I just want to spend some time in prayer um, before we go and, and get our kids and go have lunch with our families and watch the lions beat the bears. <clears throat> but for a serious moment, um, I want to pray into this. I want to look at, at and, I, and also I want to give us an assignment. Um, as you guys go throughout your weeks, I don't know what your, what your reading habits are of, of Bible reading, but, but can you journey with me? Can you guys read a portion of Nehemiah this week? There's, you know, there's some parts that are really easy to read that just totally engross you, and then there's other parts where it's talking about like lineage and stuff like that. You know what? If you've got... If, Try to read through the lineage. If you can't get through it and you're like, I am totally bored, like, go ahead and move on. But, but try to get through it because even though, even though it just seems like this long list, you get this understanding of how important this was. Why was it put in the Bible? Why was this long list of names put in the Bible of, of who helped build this wall? Because these people were, were people. They were human beings just like you and me. And their name was put in there because they were normal people that did something spectacular. And it deserved honor to be put in that Bible. You know, the Bible would talk about these nobles that were not very good. The Bible didn't bother to list their names. Nehemiah knew these guys well. He didn't bother to write their names. Lord, I thank you that we get to come into your house every week together as a community. God, I thank you that the first thing that you've called us to is to love you with all of our heart. And Father, I, I personally i repent to you for sometimes getting those switched around like that our purpose is mission versus your presence god i know that you've called us to do things that you've called us to do things in this land and things in this city but first and foremost we want to be like nehemiah we want to be like the backstory of nehemiah that knew you well that knew how to pray without ceasing, that had a heart after you and knew how to surround himself with people that had a heart after you. Lord, as we, as we see this first element of, of revival, this prayer and fasting that we've even been talking about this for weeks god we know that i know that we don't have it locked down yet we know we don't have we can't pass go until we've got this figured out god would you help us walk through these steps would you help us to to teach us to to bring to the next level what it means to be a church that prays and to be individuals that pray I know, I know I need your help, God. Yes. 
And God, as we go this week and we read our scripture, I pray that you would turn on the light behind it, that it would completely illuminate, God, that for, for some of us reading narrative story uh, never has been very, very uh, fulfilling in their life, but God, I pray that this, this story would just be enhanced in their life, that they would find good meat in the scriptures. God, teach us how to be a light into our city. And I just pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.